And so, you know, can I say I love Frankston? And I know Trudy and Bill would say the same. We love this city. We want to see a good outcome for Frankston. This service provides an incredibly important need in Frankston. We can, this city needs us. It needs us. If we went away tomorrow, this city would be impacted in a very, very negative place. Having said that, had they approached us, or had, sorry, had the government not approached me and said, we want to help you, we would have found our own building by now. We would have just gone and looked for one and found one. And to be honest, we didn't look because they kept saying, trust us, we're going to do this. Trust us, trust us, trust us. Now, they've offered this incredibly um, poor outcome. Now, I would like to apologise this morning to you for trusting them because I feel that I've failed you. Why don't you just spend the house, any house? You know, I, I've said to you so many times, just trust me, it's going to be okay, because they said it to me, and I'm, I regret saying that, I'm sorry. You know, but we do believe there's going to be a way through. But the sad reality is, friends, today, today we have to be out of this building. Thousands of vulnerable people could be left out in the cold with nowhere to turn because of government red tape. Frankston's City Life Kitchen will be forced to close within weeks unless a new home for the vital service can be found. Joel Crean has this exclusive report. It's a little cafe in Frankston serving hot meals, but in turn it delivers so much more. If it wasn't for them, honestly, I wouldn't be here now. I'll be dead. But with this, they've got friendship, companionship, good meals. Now, after more than two decades providing 14,000 meals a year, the City Life program is reluctantly shutting up shop. City Life is, is all about caring for the disadvantaged. And these people have nowhere to go after we close. Their current property has been sold to make way for apartments. And despite its promise of support, the state government has failed to find a suitable new home. Today, the volunteers and clients were told they have to be out. We'll cease to function. And they were devastated. This, this place not only feeds people, but, but it's also a family. There's no way nobody else can go to. City Life has never asked for help. It runs on the generosity of others. But now they are desperate. We need a building we need, and we also need people to support us. We really need perhaps financial support or people that would like to say, hey, we believe in what you do and we'd like to help. The state government says it has come to the table with options for city life and that's not being disputed. But so far, none of them have been suitable. This old dentist building, now an art gallery, doesn't have toilets and it doesn't have a kitchen. A government spokesperson told 10 Eyewitness News it's hoped those who use the service can continue to receive support. But without a new home, it'll be last meals later this month. It's a hard day. Joel Crean, 10 Eyewitness News. Thanks, Luke, for bringing that together. Listen, um, I want you to turn in your Bibles. I'm going to kind of just spring off that and just say a few thoughts this morning. Um, turn in your Bibles to Ephesians with me. If you can, if you have a Bible. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Now, in Ephesians chapter 6 um, is, is really a, a passage of scripture about, about spiritual warfare and and um, I just want really, I really felt to um, just share some thoughts out of this with you this morning. It says in verse 12, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers. You know, friends, it's really easy to think um, we're in a flesh and blood battle. And, um, and you have to contend with words or with even human strength. But um, I actually believe our, our fight is not in the realm that we're in right now. It's in the realm of the spirit. And, and I believe, you know, even as a 
ministry, city life is involved in a tussle, but this is not on a human level. Um, you know, one, one of the things that's happened because, um, because this thing's been posted online, all of a sudden there's this kind of groundswell of people that are now commenting and saying things and and it's it's such a it kind of grieves me i'll be honest I, I what's happened we live in a day of uh, technology and to a time where it's so easy to comment on a facebook post and all of a sudden all these people are starting to say things on facebook and 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 i guess if i step back i think man i probably didn't really think through what was about to happen and suddenly we've been thrown into the midst of a, a you know quite a quite an grievous situation and I'm disappointed that that's happened. You know, people say things often without thinking because they have a grievance or perhaps they've been misunderstood, but that the battle belongs to the Lord. And I want to say that so clearly this morning. It's not our battle. It's the battle. You know, we've prayed so much about this and I've prayed more over the last month or so than I have for a long time. You know, I just... Don't have to, actually, to be frank, I've kind of run out of things to pray. I just kind of been going down the beach and just sitting there and not even sure what to say, you know. But one of the things that I felt God share with me is that we need to learn to stand and let Him fight for us. You know, one of the promises that God has given to me, and I believe this is a promise I shared last week about this that that the Lord gave this to Steve's group. Then when I was praying on a Tuesday. It's taken out of the book of Exodus as the children of Israel were running from Egypt. They looked and they could see that they were being pursued by the Egyptians. And they complained to Moses, you should have let us die in Egypt. It would have been better for us to, than perish in this wilderness. And Moses stood and he declared to the, for the children of Israel. And he said, stand firm and you will see the deliverance of the Lord who will bring this today. And I believe that's a promise, you know, we, we, we are standing, believing for an outcome and we believe that, you know, city life is caught in the middle of this thing and, and frankly, part of me goes, I wish Doug would have gone here, you know, but unfortunately we are here now. You know, as we know, the Red Sea opened up and the Israelites walked across on dry land and a tremendous story of victory. You know, I don't know how, but I do believe that God has a promise to us and in the midst of the battle he is the one that will fight for us you know there's a contest in the spirit realm over the city you know one of the things that we we, we believe that God planted us here to care for the poor and to look after the disadvantaged that's what we believe God gave us to do and I'm you know if you, you've been around me a long time you'll know that I'm very passionate about doing that and you know, it's been a tremendous price for us to do that. It's not uh, been an easy thing. But I believe that um, the service that we provide here in the city is so needed for Frankston. One of the things about land, it represents authority. Whenever you have a property, it actually represents the, the authority that you've been given. And, and keys actually represent influence. And I believe the attack or the... Or the war that we're in right now is not so much about our ability to look after the poor but about our influence and our authority here in this city that's and that's what i believe god is trying wants us to stand you know he has given and i've said this to you many times i've been invited get invited to many things here in the city and i believe there's a, a voice of influence is given to me because of the care we've given to so many of his broken ones his poor ones and um and I believe there's a challenge against that. You know, we're not so, so much siding, fighting for a new home, but a new place of authority and a new level of influence. You know, I believe God de desires, he longs to give influence to his bride. But the enemy won't simply step out of the way. Amen? He, you know, he mu we must stand on the promises of God to, to inherit the spheres of influence that God's given to us. And, you know, I, 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 you know, one of the things that I really believe about Frankston is that God has a plan for this city. I really do. I, I love Frankston. I love all the churches of our city. You know, right, right now it's kind of interesting. I've been 
kind of inundated with all these people writing to me that I don't know and saying things to me. And I've actually stayed out of it. I haven't commented on any Facebook post. I, everyone else seems to be commenting and saying things. And it's getting kind of dirty. People are saying things that I have never said. They're saying, oh, the government offered you $400,000. Can I say clearly they've never done that? They've never been offered money. They've actually offered us this property in, in Beach Street. And, and I guess there would be money attached to try and get it functional, you know. And, and part of me thinks maybe I should have just shut up and accepted it. But I just really felt that it was not the right thing. And we felt the way they did that was so wrong. You know, there was a... In the, in the Civil War in America, there was a man called General Lee. And he was an interesting guy. He was actually a, a Confederate leader. And he actually said to his troops, you are not allowed to demonize the enemy because he knew the time would come that America needed to be one country again. And you know, he understood that it was not profitable to hate the other side. He understood there was a tussle going on, but the time came, the war was over, and America became a one nation again. And it's, I, I feel it's so important here, please don't demonize our city. Please don't go and speak things against the government. We don't need you to do that. You know, I, I, um, I guess in all this, if I can be really honest, I've become quite good friends with people in the government. I guess right now they don't like me, I get it, you know. And, and I, you know, kind of enjoyed being with them and, and, and I've enjoyed the influence that I was given there. But I believe that God has spoken to me and said, you know, the problem with the, the po political spirit, by its very nature, it's actually corrupt. Within its system itself, it's corrupt. Yeah, and, it's and God wanted to give me influence, but not to get seduced into the, the actual power base of the politics. And, yeah. and I'm to be a real honorable here today, but I, I just want you to know that I've learned some pretty valuable lessons. You know, it's kind of interesting in the Old Testament, two very significant prophetic voices. One was Daniel, who, who God put next to the king. He didn't make him the king. And one of the things that we often think, oh, well, you know, we want to get Christians into politics. Well, what happens is the politics corrupts the Christian. Yeah. Yeah. And it's because of the actual corrupt, corruption in the system. And I think there's a, there's a place of influence for godly or good people to speak to government, to speak into those things that need to be spoken to. And I think that's a lesson that I've needed to learn. And perhaps it's been a pretty difficult one for me. Remember, we do not struggle against flesh and blood, against the human realm, but against principalities and powers in the heavenly realm. You know, the Lord uses completely unique ways to fight on our behalf. Have you ever figured that out? He uses ways that are not natural. You know, he promises, no weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue that rises shall be Condemn. You know, it's really interesting if you look at the original language that this was written in, that any word that is used to stand against us in a court of law will be refuted. That's what it's saying. Even if someone would stand and, and accuse you falsely, that will be refuted by the Spirit of God. And if we take matters into our own hands, we're undermining, I believe, what God wants us to do. How? Well, usually not how we imagine. You know, the Bible says in Isaiah 58, My ways are not your ways, says the Lord. My ways are higher than your ways. You know, he has access to information that we do not have. We operate on the human level and our thoughts and reactions come from our own understanding. He's the Alpha and he is the Omega, he is the beginning and he is the end. He says, trust me in this and I will sort it through. You know, lean not upon your own understanding. And the problem with our own understanding, friends, is that our understanding comes from a limited perspective. But God does not have that limitation. He understands what's going on. He understands all the things that are happening. He has access to every conversation, every plot, every plan, and he's so very patient. 
The Lord is just and His mercies are new every morning. The battle is that we're in mostly takes place in our thought life. Have you ever noticed you can have been having a really, really good day and just walk along and then someone will say to you, did you hear that so-and-so said this about you? And suddenly your good day takes a nosedive. Has anybody ever done that? It's like when you think everybody likes you, 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 you think, hey, the world's a good place. But then you realize someone has criticized you and suddenly everything goes bad. Because the battle is actually in the realm of our mind. You know, the realm of our thoughts and emotions of the realm, the enemy is constantly trying to assail. He comes to bring discouragement and accusation. One of the names of the enemy is the accuser of the brethren. What do you think someone who's called the accuser does? He accuses. He says, you know, you're no good. You'll never be any good. Hey, you're hopeless. Your mother doesn't love you. The world doesn't like you. You may as well just give up. Because he is an accuser of the brethren. That's one of his names. He constantly accuses us falsely. When you're under attack, it's accusation that comes against us. It's kind of interesting whenever there's a control spirit, someone who has a manipulation or a control spirit, often tremendous discouragement and fear will attack your mind. There's an amazing story found in the Old Testament where Elijah stood up against the prophets of Baal. And he stood before these hundreds of prophets. He alone was the only (laughs) prophet from God. And he said, let's have a contest. And he invited all these prophets of Baal to call upon their God. And they called for hours and they cried out to, to their God, their Baal. And they said, let's see whose God answers by fire. And they cried and they cut themselves and they sang and they danced all day and all night. And there was no fire fell. This contest was arranged by God. Once they failed to get Baal Baal to answer, Elijah took an offering. He poured water over it till it was just completely wet. And he prayed a simple prayer and he said, God, I thank you that you are my father. And instantly fire fell from heaven and consumed all the offering. And I want to say to you this morning, the supernatural of God is there. But... It's really interesting what happened to Elijah straight after this. This woman called Jezebel, she sent a message through someone and she said, you will be as dead as my prophets by the end of of this day. This man who'd stood up against all this demonic stuff suddenly was thrown into such a discouraging place that he prayed, God, kill me. I want to say to you this morning, when you're under attack, when you get under a place, particularly when you get attacked with, with what I'd call like a witchcraft spirit or a control spirit, you will get discouraged. Yes. You'll feel like giving up. Yes. You'll feel like I can't go on. And if you ever find yourself in that place of discouragement, ever find yourself in that place where you just feel overwhelmed, almost out of the blue, then you can suspect there's probably been a control thing going on in your journey somewhere. And you know, we need to learn to recognize when the enemy is throwing his darts. You know, Peter says he comes like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Friends, he's not a roaring lion, but he comes like a roaring lion. You know, he comes along. Did that scare you? I'll put you counseling like that. But that's what he does. He comes along and he, he comes like a roaring lion. Whoa, this is so big. But the truth is, he's not a roaring lion. He's been defeated. Friends, today, 
We just need to take what Peter says, resist him, and he will flee. See, all we have to do, Anne, is resist me, and I'll go away. <laughs> I'll just leave you alone after that. Resist me. I apologize, Anne. She's given me the sign of the cross. <laughs> You will never sit there again, will you? <laughs> Today, friends, we are sons and daughters of the Most High God. And no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Every tongue that rises shall be condemned. We simply need to stand and see the salvation of God. Resist Him and He will flee. You know, apprehended when the enemy seeks to attack us gives us an edge. You know, one of the things that you need to recognize is your mind is a battleground. Who, who had ever figured that out yet? That your mind is a battleground. Let's have a look at this scripture as I kind of land this thing. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, it says, Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not come. <laughs> That they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down um, uh, arguments, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Friends, this is spiritual warfare 101. We do not war as this world wars, not with human weapons, not with our, with our mouth but with spiritual ones. The weapon we wield are not carnal, not of this world, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. You know, the weapons we have are the realm of the Spirit. When Jesus said, I have given you power over all the power of the enemy, there's two interesting words here. I've taught about this previously, but it's very important you understand the two Greek words, one is exousia, the other is dunamis. He says, I have given you exousia over all the dunamis of the enemy. And this word exousia is actually a word that, that we've mistranslated to say power, but it's actually the authority. And he's given you authority this morning. I've given you authority over all the works of the evil one. That's a great place to be, friends. That's a wonderful place to be. Authority in the realm of the Spirit. Authority over the works of darkness. Authority in the realm of God. You know, Exousia speaks about the place God has given to us. But the enemy tries to drag us into the realm of the flesh because that's his territory. If he can get you to lash out, to retaliate, to get angry, you start to enter his territory. If he can get you to, to start to take it personally, if he can get you to get involved in this little war down here, but he said, she said, he said, then he's got you operating right where he wants you to be. If he can get you to get resentful, to get judgmental, and allow bitterness to take root in your heart, you're allowing a stronghold to form in your life. You know, when, when the, the readers or when the original readers of this passage of scripture heard him teach about strongholds, they understood that. In our culture, it's not something that we're familiar with, familiar with, but a stronghold to them was very clear. It was a place of fortification that was fortified against all oncomers. Everybody that, they, that came near them, they could see them as they came because they were fortified and sat up in a high place. And you know, that's what a stronghold is. And if we have a stronghold in our life, it's a belief system or a truth that is not true. A truth that says to you, well, I'm this or I'm that. It can be, you're like, I'm no good or I'm a failure or I'm actually addicted but the truth is, I'm a son of God, or I'm more than a conqueror through him. You know, a place where the enemy has you deceived, this is just how it is. Hey, just accept it. Just live in defeat. Well, I want to say to you, I don't have to live in defeat because I'm a son of God. 
You know, the language of strongholds are things like, I can't. I can't do that. It's too hard. I just can't help it. That's the language of a stronghold. But the authority we have in Christ is our words. When I speak, I have the authority of Christ. Not a human thing, but a supernatural authority. You're his son, and when we declare something, you're speaking with his authority. Isn't that cool? You say it with the authority of Christ. You know, Paul tells us, pull down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts it itself against the knowledge of God. Every high thing, friends. The enemy knows that if he can get you to get proud and arrogant and boastful, that's, that's the realm he operates in. But we need to stay humble and teachable before him. You know, as a young believer, I, I learned this. I became a Christian, as most of you have heard my story, but came to Christ and I was just kind of just so messed up. I got Christ in my heart and suddenly I realized the authority I had. His word suddenly became real to me. And the very words that Christ gave to, to his church were my promises. And I started to walk in those promise, promises. You know, I didn't go looking for it, but I would pray and and things would start to manifest. The enemy would be revealed. His tricks would be uncovered. And what happened my first kind of year of, I was telling someone the other day, uh, my first year of becoming a Christian, I actually separated myself for about a year. I, I wouldn't have a television or radio. And I don't do this now, but back then I, I kind of got so like madly in love with Jesus. It was just so cool. I refused to have a television set. I wouldn't have a row. I went and bought a stereo for my car and it wasn't, didn't have a radio on it. Cause, and it was really all about I wanted to get close to him. And, and you know, by the end of that first year, the supernatural power of God was starting to manifest around my life because I, cause I really separated myself for him. And you know, you, you might think, well, that's not necessary. And I, I think probably it isn't. But for me, it was at that point that I got my heart right. I allowed him in. I allowed him access. And so many stories, th things that happened. You know, I, I lived in a house. And one of the reasons I do what I do today is I, I, I take these people into my home. And, and God would give me this ability to set them free. And get them, help them to walk from a place of bondage into a place of freedom. And I didn't know what I was doing. In fact, still don't really. But... But God used me to walk in that realm for His Spirit. And it was just so significant. And when He said, I've given you authority over all the power of the enemy, He wasn't making a nice statement, but it was a spiritual reality. It wasn't just, you know, hey, that's good. That's nice. Let's, that's a good scripture to put on your wall and above your coffee table. But it's actually a truth about who you are. In Christ, nothing shall stand against you. Now, finally, Paul says to his hearers in this passage, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And friends, this is such a secret, to bring our thoughts into captivity. You know, it's your thoughts that get you into trouble. You know that, don't you? It's your thoughts. Our mind. It's the enemy's play, playground. He, he plants thoughts. We, he gets us to dwell on things. The what ifs. What if I said that? What if this happened? What if these things went on? What if, what if, oh, you know, in the middle of all this stuff with, with the government, I, my brain's been going, but what if this happens? And I've had to say, God, help me to take my thoughts captive. Help me not to let my thoughts become rampaging. Help me to not allow my thoughts to overwhelm me here. Help me to try to, to submit myself to you. And friends, that's the place he wants us to be. You know, crazy thoughts, rehearsing things. Who's ever laid in bed and rehearsed the same story over and over and over? A conversation you had 20 years ago. I and over how, and you can remember how she said it, how he said it. You can remember what he was wearing. You know how it went, and it goes over and over, and you play it over and over in your mind. Take your thoughts captive yes. and say, I'm not going to let that rampage in my heart anymore. 
I'm not going to let that thing dictate to me what I'll become. If you let that thing play out, it's not going to, you know, you play an old story and you're never going to get a new beginning, a, a new ending. The ending remains the same. Have you figured that one out yet? It goes over and we play the story, get to the end of the story. She said, he said, we said, I did. And you cannot live in regret, friends. You cannot change the past, but you can change your future. It's in your hands. And if you allow your past to dominate your present, then your future will be dominated as well. You need to learn to allow those things that are behind you to get behind you. Paul says, bring these into captivity. Don't allow them to run their path. Saying, no, I'm not going to let my thoughts go astray. You know, friends, temptation is not sin. But giving in to temptation is where sin starts. When you're tempted to look with lust, you can resist it. You know that, don't you? When you're tempted, it's not sin. But it's when you allow that temptation to move to the next, that next place of starting to dwell in, in that place. When I was a young believer, my, my pastor used to, say, used to say, we need to develop an instant rejection shoot. When that thought comes in, we reject it. We reject it. And it's, there's some good theology in that. We need to learn to take the things that come against us and say, no, I'm not going to dwell on that lustful thought. I'm not going to let that resentful feeling start to dominate me. Because, friends, as you let those things get a hold of you, they will control what goes on in your heart. We can resist it. When you allow your thoughts to fester, to dwell and to settle, it enters you into another place. And we need to learn to discipline our mind. And one of the important things to do, of course, is, is let the Word of God dwell in you. Hallelujah. What does it say, um, Tony, about the Word of God? <laughs> Thy Word. Your Word I have given in my heart that I might not sin again. Your word have I hid in my heart that I might... Thank you, mate. Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. And friends, we need to let the word of God. You know, that's what that's our life bring. One of the reasons the Bible is so attacked today, you know, by those... those Ultra, whatever they are. So they say, you know, the Bible's no longer reliable. What I say, it's 100% reliable. It's the word of the living God. You can trust it with all of your hearts. You know, Romans chapter 12, it says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And our mind is renewed as we allow this word to enrich, watch over us and wash us and strengthen us. Friends, this is a time, you know, we're in a bit of a, a, a tussle. And I want to say to you, you know, God is, is telling me to stand, you know. In the natural, I wish I wasn't here, I'll be honest. But we are. And we are standing on what He's promised to us. So today, the Lord wants you to remember, we fight not against flesh and blood. We need to take every thought captive. And we need to renew our minds Amen. by the reading and the, and the inculcation of the Word of God. Let it dwell in your hearts. Let it become strong in your life. Let the Word of God enrich you. You know, I, um, I love the fact that God chooses the weak and the foolish. And, and that's one of the promises that I kind of hang on to. One of the things that I often talk to them about is that scripture out of 1 Corinthians, that God chooses weakness to shame the strong. He doesn't go looking for talent. He doesn't go looking for people that have got great skills. He looks for those that understand, hey, within me, I've got nothing. But he is what is my strength. And, you know, I love the fact that God chooses the weak and the foolish. The shine the strong. Okay, let's all stand this morning as I finish. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord God, that your word 
will dwell richly in our hearts this morning. And I, I pray that you would help us to stand. Lord, I thank you for Paul Edgebrook this morning and for the government. And I pray, Lord, where we have um, offended, where we have spoken against them, forgive us, Lord. Help us, Lord God, to stand and I'll let you fight for us here. Lord, I thank you that your outcome will be the outcome that you've called us to have. I thank you for um, your promise. I thank you for your wisdom. I thank you also, Jesus, that you know the way that's before us in this. And Lord, you're going to make a way where there is no way. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Please stay and, stay and have lunch with us. We've got some, some nice hot dogs and lots of all homemade relishes and homemade chutneys and things are going to happen today. And this, you know, if you haven't got any money, it's free. But if you want to put a donation in, please do that. But you're welcome to stay and join us for a hot dog. Please um, hang around, have a bit of fellowship. God bless you. If you'd like some prayer this morning, we'd love to pray with you. Have a wonderful week in Jesus' name. God bless you.